welcome to this uh, wednesday musing with uh, professor dr borate sir and we have an interesting topic today on making of a good orthopedic surgeon uh, for everybody listening on ortho tv and ortho tv youtube ortho tv facebook as well as on clubhouse so you can post your questions anywhere on any of the platforms uh this has been relayed live on all the platforms and we'll have a great and interesting conversation on this uh, making of a good orthopedic resident as well as a surgeon so i'd like to invite uh, dr tarang nar who is our host today to pro- uh, to proceed with the event go ahead tarang thank you sir thank you sir for the wonderful wednesday musing and this ortho tv's brain child which was a few weeks back now it is growing up we, we started with how to train an orthopedic surgeon orthopedic resident then it we spoke about how to be how to practice orthopedic surgery and now we are going to talk on uh, we are going to discuss uh, with dr madho borate sir on uh, how to be a good orthopedic surgeon how to stand out out of all the amongst all the ortho orthopedic surgeon so what better way to learn to be a good orthopedic surgeon rather other than being a good resident to start with sir yes so as uh, so we would like to know from you we discussed about the surgical curriculum of the residents we discussed on the practices we discussed on specialized and generalized orthopedic practices in the past talks so we would like to start this talk on being a good orthopedic surgeon by knowing what uh an esteemed speaker like you or a professor like you expects from a resident to become a good resident yeah thank you uh, tarang and uh, uh let me begin by saying that uh, we hope that all the residents that undergo training uh, would end up becoming a competent and capable orthopedic surgeon but uh, we have uh, seen over the years that there are a few qualities that separate the good and the uh, achievers from from the from everybody else and uh, various uh, studies have shown up the same qualities that define uh, what being a good resident means for example the first and the most important quality that has universally been acknowledged by all the teachers and the consultants is the quality of being trustworthy now this is an absolute prerequisite that is a expected out of anybody who is serving as a resident because the <clears throat> resident uh, is required to be the eyes and ears of the consultant and the consultant depends and relies on the resident being diligent being truthful being honest and being extremely regular and consistent in reporting whatever is happening to the patient because that is the only way that the consultant would know and be able to intervene and help in maintaining the health and solving the difficulties of the patient another thing that uh, is a part of being trustworthy is to know your limitations to know that you cannot understand something that is happening you do not know what to do in a given situation and you are not hesitant in asking for help and in accepting and admitting to yourself that you do not have the required knowledge or you need help in a given situation so these two things uh, define uh, mostly what being or what is expected in the word trustworthy i think tarang is uh, somehow yeah okay you have yeah, i am here i am here sir yes sir 
Okay, so I was just talking about the uh, first and most trust important worthy. quality. Trustworthy, being trust. trustworthy. And right. uh, I have I have seen that this is a, a special problem in India. I am sorry to say, but in our Indian culture, we are somehow uh, quite uh, often very uh, liberal with the truth. We tend to uh, interpret things in ways that will be construed in other societies as being lies or being dishonest or being untruthful. And uh, this is a big problem uh, because I have noticed when Indian uh, doctors uh, go uh, to study and work in other uh, countries, Western countries, this is one common problem that they uh, find that there is zero tolerance. There is absolute no tolerance of any kind of uh, lies or misrepresentation for anything. And if you are caught or if it is detected that you have uh, been doing such things for more than one occasion, I have seen uh, and I have heard from my own daughter who is a physician there that such persons are thrown out of the program, no matter which country they come from, no matter who they are. We in India should learn from this and uh, expect and demand more trustworthiness from all residents. That's what I would say. Okay, sir. So, like it has been always said, a good assistant or a good trainee goes ahead and lands up in becoming a good orthopedic surgeon. So now, coming to be being a our, uh, talk, how to become a good orthopedic surgeon and stand out amongst approximately 20,000 orthopedic surgeons in India. I suppose last time we discussed the data as well in our last talk. So, so obviously... So I, we, I, I would like to... Uh dwell a little more on the resident part sure, sir, uh, sure, sir. because because uh, there are a few other things that I would like to mention. Sure, uh, the second most important thing that is expected of a good resident is efficiency. Now, efficiency is something that many people do not understand. Like being hardworking is not enough to be efficient. Uh, working too hard is not necessarily a uh, quality that is construed as being efficient. Efficiency is a skill. Efficiency has to be learned. Efficiency has to be developed. It begins with understanding that although there are numerous tasks that we are expected to accomplish in a given day as a resident, they can be prioritized in a manner that allows one to complete everything in a timely fashion. And another thing is that the reality of today is that we are expecting our residents to be more efficient with each passing year because our patient volumes are increasing, our documentation is increasing, and Unfortunately, the overall number of the residents that are in the system is not changing uh, to that extent. So whoever is there has to work more and is forced to become more efficient. So you must be able to manage a substantial inpatient caseload, a substantial outpatient attendance every day, formulate and execute treatment plans and be prepared to uh, assist and work with challenging operations and as if that is not enough to publish original research. And in addition to that, you are expected to make time for your family, you are expected to get exercise and you are expected to maintain a semblance of a normal life. So this is a big task, but this is what is crucial for a resident to learn and develop 
to become a good consultant. Becoming a consultant doesn't make things easier. But if you become good at being a resident, it will you will find it easier to be good as a consultant. And another thing that I need to mention is this concept of self-directed learning. See, a lot of the residents, when they come into the system, they have absolutely no knowledge of orthopedics. They have absolutely no experience of working as a resident doctor. And so they come with a lot of um, uh, deficiencies. And it is necessary for them to very quickly educate themselves. Now, this education is not as easy as one would like to believe because there is no clear and simple panacea. There is nothing like if you just read the book, I will get all the knowledge. If I just assist, I will very quickly get knowledge. The thing is that you must develop the skill of self-directed learning. And for that, they have to understand that every single thing that they do during the day is a learning experience, is an experience that they should absorb. And they should supplement those real experiences of treating patients, looking at problems, trying to find solutions, and doing whatever you're asked has to be supplemented with reading and asking questions and getting information whichever way you can. And this learning is for yourself. It has nothing to do with how you will be perceived. Unless you decide that you will get better, nobody can help you to get better. And the process of getting better requires self-directed learning. And that self-directed learning uh, has to, each one has to decide how much they need to do to be successful, to learn in the shortest possible time, and to keep learning because learning is a is not a process which ends at any point. And another thing that I uh, have noticed that good residents always practice is attention to detail. I never stop telling this to people that the whole uh, uh, reason for real success is attention to detail because the devil is in the details. You may know how to do an operation and you may think that you can just do it, but if there is not enough attention to detail in everything, uh, it is going to cause you multiple uh, challenges. And the only way that you can get better and be good and be consistent is to trust no one. Do not trust anybody. That means what I mean is your fellow, your colleagues as residents, the people who work in the nursing, the people who work in helping in you, the only way you will make sure that nothing goes wrong every single day, every single patient, every time you are involved and you are responsible is to trust no one. That will ensure you to develop an attitude and a ability to think of multiple things, numerous things at the same time and make sure that nothing is going wrong. Another thing that people um, talk about is being professional. So what is, what is this thing about being professional? What does being, pre being professional mean? We say he's a good professional. It means that you must have a higher perceived technical ability. You must have higher perceived knowledge and you must be extremely conscientious in your behavior in everything that you do and it does not necessarily stop at the hospital or as a resident even in your personal life even in your social life your professionalism or lack of it will be noticed and will be uh, will define who you are Another thing that we often take for granted is that a good resident is expected to be a good person. He is expected to be, as we say, available, affable, and able. 
which in simple words means that you have to be friendly to get the cooperation of everybody who works with you. You have to be helpful. You have to be cordial to everybody. You have to be understanding of the difficulties and the limitations and sometimes the personal uh, problems of the people around you. And you must be always willing to, to take up the job of educating people, of explaining people. And over a period of time, not only will you gain their trust and their affection, you will also, through your own personal efforts, improve the efficiency of the entire group that is working. So being personable or being a good person and a friendly person is, is uh, very, very important to, to that effect. And uh, that, there, I don't think that uh, all of the residents that I see uh, are always um, uh, passing the barrier. I've seen very good residents who are extremely impatient and very sometimes they have very poor control of their temper and emotions. And uh, that definitely affects uh, the entire team as well as the perception what they, uh, they generate about themselves. And lastly, a good resident has to be academically oriented. He has to find the time, he has to make the effort to, to be able to publish something. If during your residency, if you are able to have or uh, successfully able to get, uh, to generate one good publication, you are going to become part of that elite uh, consultants who will continue to publish and who will therefore become part of the smaller group of not only good orthopedic surgeons but highly successful orthopedic. That's, uh, I think, what I wanted, would like to have said about yes, making of a, of a great resident. Right, sir. So just to add an input, uh, when sir mentioned about attention to details, I think the um, uh, attention to details and uh, trust no one go hand in hand. An example would be when, uh, a resident who is very good for the first and the second year. He becomes complacent and at ease when he enters the third year. And then he depends upon his first juniors and uh, his juniors not being that great as he was in the first and second year. So the third year resident can, uh, might have to take the brunt of their mistakes. So that is what sir meant by trust no one and being, uh, giving attention to details till the last day of your residencies. So I, wonderful. Yeah, I'd, like uh, to share, I'd like to share an uh, anecdote of what happened to me personally. Sure. When I joined as a resident in the JJ hospital, uh, my registrar was a wonderful guy. And uh, I thought that I was a very good resident. And uh, in the first uh, uh, month or so, he we took the rounds and he told me that you, uh, I need to do the dressings of some patients or like that. And I said, yes, definitely. Sure, I'll do that. And then he went away. And this was in sometime in the morning, I mean, 11 o'clock. And somehow I uh, did not do the dressing of all the patients. I One or two patients, I thought, we'll do it later on in the day. And uh, it's okay if I do it uh, in the evening or something like that. And when my registrar came down for uh, to the ward at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, he discovered that those dressings were not done. He politely sent a call for me to report to the ward. And he waited for me till I came. And when I came, he just told me, look, I think you have forgotten to do this thing. And uh, I would like you to complete it just now while I'm there. He did not scold me. He did not say anything. But he made sure that I understood that it was not acceptable to not do whatever he had told me to do. Now, this would not have happened unless he was diligent to make find out whether I had done what I was expected to do. And because he was diligent, I realized at that moment that that is the level of compliance that is expected of me. And after that, it became very easy for him to supervise me because 
in that one uh, incident. So that's what I meant by don't trust anyone. That's what he taught me uh, through his own diligence. Right. To sum it up, to be a great resident, you have to be trustworthy. You have to be professional. You have to be presentable. You have to have the ability to uh, innately be motivated, self-driven, and um, to uh, self-learning ability. And you have to do all this by very efficiently, at the same time, giving time to your health and family as well, sir. Uh, yeah. That's to sum up on being a great resident. This great resident will uh, further definitely go and land up to become a wonderful surgeon and stand out amongst the all orthopedic uh, surgeons. So to start with, uh, being how to be a great and a good orthopedic surgeon. What are the characteristics of a good orthopedic surgeon? Uh, I'm sure many of us know that he has to be has has the surgical dexterity and uh, he has to have the clinical acumen. So we'll dwell on this as well, and we will also. Uh, see what are the other uh, qualities or a hidden qualities that a good orthopedic surgeon has from Dr. Borate sir, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are many things that make a good orthopedic surgeon. Uh, one thing that uh, most people uh, assume that uh, they have, but which many of them uh, do not have to the extent that uh, patients appreciate is a good bedside manner. You know, you may be a great expert, you may be a very knowledgeable person, but you have to be, or you have to be able to communicate your warmth, your friendliness, and your uh, empathy to your patients. Your patients have to feel reassured uh, with the way you communicate with them, the way you uh, treat them, and the way you uh, interact with them. Uh, it is very difficult for a lot of patients to have a doctor who is aloof, who is you know, very coldly analytical and clinical, who appears to be uh, unemotional and, you know, indifferent to the emotional side of almost every uh, patient who is in in a in a sense uh, confronting the problem that he is uh, faced with in terms of whatever it is relating to his body maybe it's a fracture maybe it's some problem with some of his uh, some part of his uh, skeleton. But for him, you know, the problem is real and the problem is very, very uh, sometimes uh, distressing. And uh, the surgeon, uh, for the surgeon, he's just a patient and it's just a problem. And uh, he, in his uh, lack of uh, um, uh, communication or lack of ability to convey and uh, his uh, empathy and uh, sympathy sometimes uh, creates uh, a lot of anxiety. So I think that most good orthopedic surgeons have this ability and at least they, they make an attempt to make sure that they have, have it enough to be perceived as good doctors by of course, you need to have knowledge of your subject, be able to diagnose and to treat patients. And uh, most surgeons are expected to have dexterity. That is the ability to do things in a very, very uh, skilled manner to perform operations. But what I find is far more important for a good surgeon is to have good surgical judgment. And good surgical judgment is something that does not come only with knowledge. It does not come only with passing an exam. It comes with application of that knowledge. And my boss used to say that, you know what, when you pass your MS orthopedic exam, you are like 
when you look up at the sky, there are lots of holes in your knowledge. There are lots of gaps in your knowledge, which only treating patients and going through uh, more treating more and more patients will help you to fill those gaps. And as you fill those gaps, you will become a better surgeon. You will become more effective and more consistent in the results that you give to your patients. And this judgment, I like to describe it in a little different way. I say that whenever a surgeon is doing an operation, an operation usually consists of a certain number of steps. And at every step, the surgeon has to make a small decision. Uh, you know, how long should my incision be? I mean, the book has taught me that it has to be five inches. Today, my patient is more obese. So maybe it's better if I take the incision a little longer. Today, my patient seems to have a less complicated and a simple problem. So maybe I could do with a little smaller incision. So the surgeon at every step in the operation has to make a small decision. And it is here that the judgment becomes important. And it is here that the pre-operative planning and the pre-operative rehearsal of what you're going to do, like actors, when they have to act or perform in a play, they rehearse. So they know their lines by heart. They know the expressions that they are supposed to read and the things they're supposed to do. It's the same with the surgeon. If he's come prepared, if he knows at every step exactly what he's going to do, he's going to do it faster. He's going to do it more easily. He's going to do it more efficiently and effectively. And to the audience, the people helping him, they are going to see a surgeon performing extremely well. He is not confused. He asks for the instruments at the right time. He knows where what he's expected to do. So the operation is like um, a musician playing an instrument or a tune or a conductor conducting an orchestra. And all that comes from a good judgment. And judgment, as I told you, comes with more, more and more work. It doesn't come automatically. It comes from a discipline of learning and applying and planning and rehearsing in your mind. So when you start performing, you're not confused. A confused surgeon will start getting irritated with the staff, start finding uh, uh, ways of dithering, of taking more time because the audience doesn't know. But the reason why he's taking more time, why he's shouting, why he's you know, hesitating is because he's not sure what he should do next. He is trying to find out or to himself whether what he is what is the right thing he should do? What is the choice he should make out of the two or three options that he has? And that is where you see in the less experienced surgeon, more anxiety, more apprehension, more stress, more tension, simply because at every step, he has to wait and figure out what he's going to do next. Whereas as one matures, as one becomes better in judgment, as one becomes uh, more wise with doing more and more operations, that's where you see your judgment becoming better and better. And uh, this is something that I find uh, important that surgeons should understand. And another thing that I uh, feel that good surgeons have to develop is flexible attitude. You know, because uh, there are so many uh, options always available. All the options may not be the best in your opinion, you know, in a given patient. But there is the patient to consider. There is his situation to consider. There is his priorities to consider. His limitations in various ways to consider. And therefore, a surgeon has to be um, able to invest time in an understanding what exactly the patient is, where he comes from, what are his needs, what is the best solution for him, considering everything, all these things, and then 
suggesting and applying that so solution which is best for the patient because every patient is different and that flexibility is a hallmark of a good human being in addition to being a good surgeon and i find that a lot of surgeons younger surgeons today don't seem to realize that a surgeon has to be realistic a surgeon has to be honest with his patient because many patients with comorbidities many patients with complex and difficult and uh, problems to treat and manage be made aware you have to be honest with them and say look what you have is something that is going to be difficult to manage we'll do our best but you should know and you should be honest enough to uh, tell rather than keep uh, telling every patient that don't worry i am so good that no matter what you have i will make you all right this is uh, sometimes uh, not a good strategy and uh, over a period of time almost all surgeons will learn that it is necessary to be more uh, realistic and practical and you know every surgeon we forget you know that what we perform in the operation theater may be uh, a wonderful uh, uh, performance but we need to be equally good and knowledgeable about selecting our patients uh making sure that or that that pre operative uh protocol has been properly followed and adjusted to the patient's uh, comorbidities and that they are given the best and appropriate post operative care uh most surgeons who think that their job is to do the operation and everything else should be done by somebody else or that the patient will magically become good because they have done such a wonderful operation i think they are very uh, wrong and uh, they will then learn through uh, problems that they will face with the post operative care and of course i have seen that those surgeons who are fortunate enough to uh, treat large number of patients in the early years of their practice and this is possible if you are working in a public hospital and so someone like me who worked for 6 years in uh, in a hospital uh, or in hospitals that had large volumes of work was very fortunate because i got to do enough volumes to become competent in uh, doing a large number of patient or different variety of problems i already said about communication skills uh, but i want to also tell about how you communicate with your own team and with your not only with your patients but with their families and uh, you have to be able to listen and understand and and sympathize with the concerns of a large number of people because sometimes you may feel irritated that this is not your job you know your job is to to learn and to practice and to um, apply your knowledge in the treatment but uh, this is required uh, if you are to be a good or perceived to be a good orthopedic surgeon you need to have leadership skills you need to inspire confidence in others i have seen that a lot of surgeons who are considered very good are considered good not at all because of what they do in the operation theater but because of the confidence that they are able to impart to everybody around them that they can deal with everything and they are un unclustered and they are calm and they are able to manage to communicate and make the team work efficiently and of course you must be emotionally strong and resilient because in in adverse situations in complicated situations where you need to be supportive of your team sometimes when they are under a lot of stress that is a test of your own uh, emotional uh, stability and resilience every day is not full of uh, 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 you know simple problems 
there are some days and a lot of days when you are facing with lot of difficult problems. And you need to be open-minded. You need to be eager to learn. You must be capable of reflecting honestly about yourself and assessing, okay, I think I don't know how to do this well. I think I need to learn to do something better than what I'm doing now. And once you are honest and you realize, then taking the action becomes easier. If I need to learn something by talking to somebody else, by discussing it with somebody, by going and observing somebody else, by spending time in a place where a large volume of the work that I need to learn better is done. All these are things that will follow. If you are honest and eager to and willing to improve yourself, and that improvement is a lifelong process, I think. Um, so, if you if you have it, it will happen. If you have less of it, it will reflect on how you are perceived and how you perform. And you know, change is happening all the time. Technology is changing the way we treat our patients, the way we communicate with them, the way we assess our outcomes. So we need to be have the ability to adapt to an ever-changing environment. And if we are able to pay attention to all these things, uh, then I'm sure that you will be perceived as not only a competent orthopedic surgeon, but a good orthopedic surgeon. So to sum up an extensive talk on tips and hidden traits of being uh, of, an, uh, of a great orthopedic surgeon, uh, when you mentioned about the points like being empathy, uh, being flexible, and uh, being technically sound as well in today's era, I just remembered a quote by, I think, uh, William Osler that the good physician is the one who treats the disease while a great physician is the one who treats the patient who has the disease. Yeah, so some, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that, that will definitely make, uh, make you stand out amongst the lot and among the ever increasing lot of 20,000 and always going ahead. So uh, another thing, when you mentioned about the surgical judgment, I would like to say that it is very important that the surgeon knows when not to operate. For example, many surgeons and many young orthopedic surgeons, they know they are so keen on getting uh, on, on operating, but it is also very important to know when not to operate. And like also someone had said that a good surgeon is the one who knows how to treat complications rather than just primarily treating a, a, a disease or a fracture but a good surgeon is the one who also knows how to treat the complications associated with it. So, and um, yes, sir. Sure. I, I, I agree with both your observations yes, sir. entirely. Yes, yes. And because if you want to stand out, out of the lot, you have to cater to a larger audience as well. Like when you mentioned about bedside manners, about speaking to uh, n number of relatives and uh, uh, clearing their doubts and counseling them to a, a, a particular this thing. And also that was a wonderful point that you have to be realistic as well. Because as it is notioned very famously and very popularly these days that we are gods, doctors are gods, but we are not actually gods. For, and, and, and in pediatric orthopedics, I do realize when my boss used to say to the parents while counseling them that some congenital deformities are not recoverable or not correctable to as good as a normal opposite limb because the child has been developed that way. So we are not God. We can just make him as good as the opposite limb, not exactly as the opposite limb. So being realistic that way is also very important. See, one thing that I uh, wanted to add was that uh, when I said uh, that you have to be flexible, uh, what I... Uh, also meant was that, you know, patients that come to you come in all sizes and shapes and all kinds of personalities. So there will be a group of patients who uh, need reassurance. 
need constantly to be told that uh, the surgeon is uh, going to take care of everything. There will be other patients who will be extremely uh, confident of the doctor and not wanting to be uh, uh, worrying about anything. They they will convey to you that they have left everything to you and they they know and they they expect that you will take care of it. They don't want to be told anything. They don't want to be burdened with any kind of uncertainty or decision that they may be and they may have to make. Then there'll be others who will be very um, happy to be treated as friends and equals and uh, will be grateful for getting explained in detail the medical aspects and the technical part of what is happening. So in your practice, you will meet a large number and all kinds of patients. So it is necessary for you to understand and uh, uh, get to know what kind of patient you are addressing at that point of time and tailor and modify your behavior and your style to, to meet the needs and the expectations of that patient. So you cannot always be friendly and jolly and jovial with everybody because a particular patient might not like it and he'll say this fellow is not serious. And another patient may say that this fellow is too serious. So you have to understand that this also needs to be done. Uh, so you are a little bit like a performer and like a, a celebrity who has to modify his behavior depending on the type of person he is interacting with. Yeah. So there is a fine line between uh, being compassionate and uh, unprofessional. Yes. So we have to just follow that fine line. So what, according to you, uh, is success full orthopedic surgeon? Should we rely on, on definitions of success in other fields or is there some difference uh, for an ortho successful orthopedic surgeon? Yeah, this is this is something that I have always found very interesting because uh, all uh, or good orthopedic surgeons would uh, be considered as successful because uh, orthopedic surgeons tend to be fairly well paid uh, for doing whatever they do. And uh, therefore, in monetary terms and in terms of perception in the community and society at large, uh, almost all uh, good orthopedic surgeons would be perceived as successes. But amongst the orthopedic community itself and amongst people who are a little more knowledgeable of this, uh, it is necessary to, uh, to understand and accept whatever is uh, the definition of success. In conventional terms, it simply means that anybody who has uh, made a lot of money and who is who has attained not only wealth but also eminence. And what is eminence is it is a position of prominence in society, a position of superiority in society. So, in 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 the orthopedic uh, world, uh, I would like to put things like somebody who becomes the head of department. And I mean, in India and in many countries, it is just by seniority and through a process of uh, going from step one in the ladder to step five. But in many other countries, merit and ability are a requisite for promotion. So therefore, becoming going to the top of the ladder is in itself an accomplishment. Then somebody who is editing a journal, it requires an enormous amount of uh, ability and, and uh, uh, talent and you know uh, insight to, to achieve that position. Uh, someone who becomes the president of IOA, for example, it is a reflection of his consistency in uh, 
you know, research, presentations, and uh, delivering of or sharing his knowledge and working in administration, uh, administrative positions to reach that point. So somebody who has read some of these landmarks is what I would like to judge uh, as successes. It doesn't mean that the others are failures, but uh, I'm talking of success in a, in, in a profession where would you say that, you know, these are the people who are um, role models. These are the people who have gone beyond being just good. And how does one go there? How, how does it happen? Who are the people who do it? And there are some co common things that actually people have done research on this, uh, Taran. People have done research and, and uh, uh, studied uh, 150 successful people and through a questionnaire have tried to find out what is it that defines them. So one thing that came out of this research was that almost every one of them had the desire. They wanted to be better. They wanted to be go beyond whatever. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Did. Sir, yeah. sorry to interrupt. So it's 158 orthopedic surgeons who are questioned, who are part yeah. of a survey, right? Yes. Yes. But okay. all of them, all of them were either, um, you know, heads of departments, people who had published, you know, books and uh, written a large number of papers, people who were presidents or past presidents of associations and so on. So regarding this desire, I have an anecdote which I need to tell you. Uh, I was a young uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon who had just passed out. And I was the secretary of the Alumni Association when Dr. Chittaranjan Ranawat had come to uh, Sanchedi Hospital. And that was the first uh, operative camp or operative, uh, live operative thing that... Uh, he, we had of joint replacement surgeries that he did over a couple of days. And as a mark of uh, his coming, we had kind of started the Alumni Association and the uh, uh, inaugural meeting was held of that uh, association and Dr. Radawat was called to address all of us. And he made a very... Uh, caustic speech and a very frank and speech. He says, you people are, uh, uh, I'm happy to say that you want to start an association. But if this desire has come out of the effect of alcohol on you, uh, go back home and after two days, if you still feel like doing that, you this is something that is serious and this is something that you should not take very lightly. Uh, later on, I was talking to him and I said quite naively to him that uh, I would like to become someone like you. And could you tell me what I should do from now on to become uh, someone as uh, good as you? So he kind of looked me up and down, you know, and uh, he said something that I will never forget. You know? He said that, young man, uh, I can only tell you this. You need to have a fire inside you. And if you have that fire, you don't need me or anybody like me to tell you what to do. You will find your way and you will do whatever is needed to become someone good. But if you do not have the fire, then no matter how much advice you get from how many successful people, it is not going to make any difference. And then he ended by saying, I hope that you will ponder over what I have said. And I hope that whatever I have said will help you. So that is why this word desire, uh, I like to say the fire within you and the fire in your belly is what is a necessary prerequisite to go beyond being just good and wanting to be great. Uh, you cannot be great without having that fire inside you. 
the other thing is that most of these people who were uh, interviewed and questioned uh, it was found that they were very satisfied with what they were doing. they loved what they were doing they enjoyed what they were doing and because they loved and enjoyed what they were doing the additional hours that they put in operating the additional hours that they had to put in uh, in reading books and you know writing papers and you know giving talks and whatever else they 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 did it willingly of course that resulted in their uh, having to sacrifice other things like spending time with their families or you know uh, on their hobbies and so on but they did all that willingly and they enjoyed it and almost all of the people who have achieved what i what i would call great success they are associated with a prolific number of publications writing books and also uh, successfully uh, getting a lot of funds for doing uh, very good research and lastly and this is quite uh, important for everyone to know that most of these people uh enjoyed good health through practice that means they didn't smoke or drink uh, excessively or usually uh, took good care of themselves in terms of diet and exercise uh, because you cannot be uh, successful and continue to work consistently hard and perform and strain your your body and your mind without being fit and healthy so these are some of the things that uh, i think uh, are what was found in this research while separating the great from the good okay sir so wonderful and i would i like sir. to hear from uh, uh, one of uh, uh, our third panelist who i think is the closest amongst us to being great ashok sham sure sir ashok sham sir hi uh, so i mean we had discussed so many factors together over a period of uh, last one hour and each of them have its own importance and it, each of it has its own requirement so it is difficult for example uh, i just saw a question on on the youtube where we are streaming live so i'll just read out the question by one of our juniors who has put up so dr preeti rajan is asking the i mean his query comes from the point that being a good surgeon the ultimate aim is to treat our patients good and for that we should get those patients to us yeah so in the current scenario all the getting patient to us ha- comes through the channels of marketing comes through the channel of commissions i should not say it but that is how you understand how it works getting patients coming to you is also a, how to remain good in that scenario I and mean, we discuss all the points but in that scenario at practical ground level being a private practicing surgeon how do we tackle that point see i i i appreciate the question actually and i i think it's a very honest question and uh, we we must appreciate Uh, the candor with which it has been uh, asked uh, i think the answer i'm going to answer it in a little uh, lateral way the one of the requirements of be- being becoming good is to treat a large number of patients and to treat a large number of patients quickly is what will make you good in a shorter time than if you got to treat them over a longer time now i call this treating a large number of patients in a short time as the critical mass so once as a surgeon you have quickly reached that critical mass or 
you have done the required amount of practice uh, that is needed to become good, then you will become good. And how do you get that when you are young and a relatively unknown and a relatively, uh, therefore, not so popular practitioner competing with a large number of people who are senior to you, sometimes who are um, um, not, uh, you know, practicing with uh, integrity and using unfair means and so on. So how do you do? What do you do? And how do you deal with it? You do everything that you can do in, uh, in the correct way and do it more than everybody else. You work harder than everybody else. You try to get to know more doctors through giving talks or to, you know, uh, getting to know them and doing voluntary work, doing free work if required. You do all that more than anybody else. So ultimately, it's a, if, if, if everything is marketing, it is a perception that makes you more successful. So to create that perception, you have to work harder and start make somehow make people realize that you have good knowledge, you are good and you are worth trying out and you will be good for your patients. Whether to also indulge in unethical practices or not is a very personal decision. I would not like to say uh, um, anything. I would not advise anybody to be unethical. But if somebody thinks that it is one way on in which uh, it will help him to become um, popular and get large volume of patients in a shorter time. I don't want to be uh, sit in judgment of anybody who chooses to do that. But I have seen enough people and most of the very successful people that I have seen in my practice and in my experience in my field have not been uh, unethical. And uh, see, trying to promote yourself is not unethical. Trying to uh, impress others with your knowledge in whatever way you can is not unethical. So there are many ways in which you can do uh, work harder to promote yourself. And I think that success will come to everybody. Uh, how to judge? The mistake we should not make is comparing our success with the success of others. Because that creates a lot of problems. Because Many of the people that you may see around you who perceivably are more successful because they are doing the wrong things. You may not know uh, how much problems they have and what kind of uh, things will happen to them in their life. So you do what you are comfortable with. You do what you think is the right thing. And that is more important. And constantly comparing one's success in material terms is a very uh, it's it, it's a no it will not make you happy and it will not achieve anything absolutely absolutely i agree on that point that mm -hmm. success is equal to happiness not the other way around yeah right. so if you feel i mean even if you're not not owning a BMW, but you are happy. Yeah, I mean that you are successful. Yes, you are yes, waking like, up in ahead. a good. Yeah, if you are waking up in a good mood every morning, you are successful. I read just came right. across. So uh, coming back to the question uh, by uh, the uh, junior uh, who posted. So I think uh, in the last talk on how to start and run an orthopedic pro practice, we have summed up this in a very nice way in the, in the last 15 minutes on how on the use of social media, on sharing your knowledge rather than just uh, showing off. So that as well. And uh, like we also ended up uh, on the thought, on the note that uh, self-publicity is the best publicity as it is free of cost. So once you start treating the more volume of patients, you will get so efficient and the patient with the word of mouth publicity, you will be getting the patient eventually. Uh, this you can do by staying un, uh, uh, within the ethical uh, grounds as well. 
and uh, that reminds me my boss our boss used to always mention about the the, the concept of 10000 hours uh, by uh, malcolm gladwell that during your initial days of practice you don't have to really worry and focus about the money you are getting for a, for a particular surgery you are you are operating you have to just worry and focus on the result and the outcome of 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 that particular surgery no matter if you are getting paid less as well that way you will increase the number of surgeries you are doing that way you will increase the you will reach the mark of the 10000 hours basically the concept there is you need to practice something for 10000 hours to become perfect in particular field and they have given examples of michael jordan and sachin tendulkar as well so i would feel that during your residency sr ship days and your early practice you have to reach you have to make sure that you reach that mark as soon as possible by doing that you are uh, becoming efficient in your surgery as well and you are getting what in to inverted commas getting the patients as well so i think uh, i would like to add up to that question sir so i like to share one more thing i mean i, I don't think that uh, anybody should emulate my uh, what i did but throughout my practice uh, more than 50% of the patients that i operated on i didn't charge anything i did them for free but the reason for this was that uh, uh, during the days that we practiced we had a large number of disabled children with poliomyelitis and you know uh, they didn't have any money they came from extremely poor backgrounds and the only way they could be operated if it was done free not only by the surgeon but also uh by donations from some charity which paid for the anesthesia and you know other uh, things that were spent so because we were treating such a large number of patients who not only did we not get paid but nobody got paid so uh, uh so there is no problem of volumes there is no problem of volumes once you decide that you're not going to charge for treatment Absolutely. whether it will whether it will fulfill your goals of getting a bmw in the shortest possible time i don't know but <laughs> you will not be uh, short of work and you will yeah. not be short of grateful patients and that i think is the biggest satisfaction of all right so absolutely so i'll so just I'll... add to that uh, 1000 10000 hour concept Yes. so it is it is a clever disguise for two base concepts of patience and perseverance so he makes the point for 10000 hours so that you can develop these two qualities so once you have this patience and perseverance you develop that kind of dedication towards your work and the byproduct is excellence in your work yes. once you are excellent in your work success will just flow in and you will actually be happier and successful both together so absolutely yes sir. so up, so now with an extensive talk over of being a good orthopedic surgeon uh, other than the uh, conventional points uh, having surgical dexterity clinical acumen catering to a larger audience having leadership and communication skills being flexible uh the two most important or rather i would say a hidden points would be the uh, self desire the fire within that innate fire within to drive you to become a good orthopedic surgeon and very most important based on the latest uh, study that borate sir mentioned that publication is so important like uh, i had uh, read somewhere if you don't publish you will perish so so to sum up uh and icing on the cake other with on the other points as well it is the publications and the self inner innate desire to do something out of the box i would hand over to you ashok sam sir so thank you very much uh, tarang it was great moderation as usual and uh, you are the fine of the year for us in terms of moderating <laughs> on club all so not so thanks even for not the tv so <laughs> now these are very very important issues that we talk about and these are um many a times i find these issues more important than core academ- academics or hardcore yes. say a trauma and arthroscopy because that can be spoken by many people 
exactly. but this these topics are covered very by very very few and the expertise and knowledge that borate sir has is Absolutely. is exceptional and you bring that out very very cleverly <laughs> and in a very very good way so thanks a lot i agree you. i agree thank you yes. thank you i think this is needed in especially in india because other other in other countries there is a protocol of hierarchy there is a protocol of practice there is a protocol of private practice as well which yes. they don't need to worry about all this but being in india we have to follow these aspects as well other than being a good at no, i i would like to make this i like to make a small correction things are different in those countries but all the things that uh, are there here are there everywhere in the world competition is there uh, there is a reward and punishment in terms of your uh, ability to treat patients so even in the meritocracy system if you are not able to get uh, the numbers that somebody else is able to get then that person who gets more patients gets paid more than the person who gets less patients so it is not that uh, uh, and then you might have to transition from a prestigious hospital to another practice So it is not that those things do not exist. It is just that they exist in a slightly different manner okay. and a, a better way and a more uh, dignified way than what happens in our environment. In our right, absolutely. Okay, sir. So we would wind up here. Yes. Yes. Thank so, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, and so just on nice an ending you. note for the for our listeners on uh, your other uh, media platforms as well. If you would uh, go back and uh, listen to our talks on how to uh, improve the surgical curriculum, and followed by how to start and run an orthopedic sp- uh, practice, this talk would make more sense. So uh, I, that is what I would like to add up here, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.